I'm helping somebody. I don't know who it is. People are trying to make you feel bad for wanting what you want, but the very fact that you want it is a sign that you are it. You only crave what... Oh. The only reason I want excellence is because I... Brothers and sisters, I am delighted to have the opportunity once again to be blessed of the Lord to give you the final deposit of this series, The View from the Top. This particular message is one of my favorites. It seemed to bless my church in unprecedented ways. It is my hope and my prayer that it will bless you as well. The message is called, You Can't Give Me What's Already Mine. Take a look at this and be blessed. Shake somebody's hand and say, I know who I am. I know who I am. The circumstances don't prove who I am. I know who I am. It might not look like I am who I am, but I know who I am. My house might not look like I am who I am, but I know who I am. My situation may not reflect who I am, but I know who I am. I refuse. I refused. I refuse to succumb to embarrassment. I need to impress you when I understand that how you met me is a temporary circumstance. Just because you met me in the wilderness does not mean I'm lost. I was led into this wilderness. <laughs> yeah, you might have met me without a job, but that doesn't make me a bum. Come on, somebody. You, you can't give me, no, 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 no. You wanna give me something, but you can't, you, you can't give me what's already mine. You, 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 you can't give me what's already mine. If I didn't know what I got, then you might make a deal with me, but you can't give me what's, and about this bread stuff, don't you know that I am the bread of, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they perish with hunger, but I am the true man. So, so don't, don't be talking to me about this bread stuff. <laughs> Tell somebody, say, you can't give me what's already mine. I am, I am, oh y'all can't handle this. I am what I'm hungry for. Y'all can't handle that. I am what I'm hungry for. That's why you want it, cause you are it. The, the very fact that you crave it is a sign that you are it. Everything seeks its own kind. You wouldn't crave love if you're not a lover. You wouldn't crave giving if you're not a giver. You wouldn't crave wisdom if you weren't wise. Fools don't crave wisdom. You, I am. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? I, I'm helping somebody, I don't know who it is. People are trying to make you feel bad for wanting what you want, but the very fact that you want it is a sign that you are it. You only crave what, oh. The only reason I want excellence is because I, don't you think this stone is going to make me what I already am? Y'all can't handle that. So, 
Sit down, I'm just talking a little bit. It, it's... Then he says, he says, now if you go up to the high place, I'm going to show you all the kingdoms of the world. And all you got to do is bow down and worship me. And, and I'm going to show you all the kingdoms that I will give you. That's what he said. But the problem with the statement is that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. It's already mine. It's just a matter of time. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but the Lord said it's already yours. It's just a matter of time. You're in a pinch right now. You're in the wilderness right now. It doesn't look like it's yours, but whatever it is you've been talking to God about, he spoke to me in my house and he told me you would be here this morning. And he told me to tell you that it's already yours. You don't have to bow to nobody. It's already yours. Take about 30 seconds and praise him for what you already got. You got about 10 seconds left to pray them for what you already got. You got about five seconds left to open your mouth and praise him like it's already up. Walk over to five people and tell them it's already mine. Say it like you mean it. Say it like you mean it. Say it like you got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's already mine. 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 Somebody's living in your house, but it's already yours. Somebody built the house. It was never for them in the first place. It was built for you, and I'm trying to get you to operate in some faith this morning and stick your chest out and hold your head up and say it's already mine. This is a Sunday morning for you to take courage, for you to get your fight back, for you to get your dignity back, for you to get your self-esteem back. I don't care what kind of deal the devil is trying to cut with you this morning. He cannot give you what is already yours. It is the Father's good pleasure to give unto you the kingdom. High five somebody and say, I got it right now. It's already mine. I'm walking in it now. I'm living in it now. I'm preaching in it now. It's already. Still to come on the Potter's Touch. This feeling that you have that somebody else has something to give you and that you may have to compromise who you are to get it is a lie from the pit. 
You, you cannot, here, here, look at me. You cannot give me what is already mine. Defeat is not an option, not on your watch. It's time to fight for the family. For every one of you who's wondering, do I have what it takes uh, for this season in my life? Uh, fight back. Let TD Jakes equip you to win the war for your house and build a legacy of faith. When you help us bless others with your gift of any size, we would like to give you I Dare You on CD. And when you complete each other, you take advantage of the differences in your position. Come on, tell me when to turn, tell me when to turn. Okay. See, I don't have to see it if she sees it. I don't have to know it if she knows it. For your gift of $70 or more, we will give you the Fight for the Family series on DVD. But when your gift is $125 or more, also receive these unique faith-inspiring bookends and prayer cards. Just call or visit tdjakes.org today. Your eye may be black and your teeth may be busted, but you look the devil in his eye and you say, baby, I'm still here. The fight is on. Touch your neighbor and say, you can't give me. You cannot give me what is already mine. I'm not at your mercy. I'm not at your mercy. You don't have the last say. The devil is a liar. It's all. I got one more thing to tell you, and I'll get out of your way. Somebody's been up under pressure, and the devil's been keeping you up at night, saying you gotta do something. You got to do something. You got to do something. You got to do something. Well, the devil is a liar. He told Jesus, in order to get the angels, you gotta throw yourself off the cliff but the devil was a liar because while he was talking, the angels were already on their way. And the Lord told me to tell you that the angels are in route. And if you just hold out a little while longer, Oh, I, I, I don't, I, 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 You see, the Bible said, without Jesus casting himself down, just standing on the word of God, that when the devil had played his last trick, the angels came down and ministered to him. And the Lord told me to tell you, don't worry, don't be afraid. Your help is on the way. Where are my radical people? Where are my radical people? Flap your neighbor and stay neighbor. Don't you see my angels? My angels are on their way. Get back, devil. My angels. The angels are on the way. The healing is on the way. The finances is on the way. The opportunity is on the way. Now this is a real test. Some people don't believe it until they see it. 
because they are doubting Thomases. But Jesus said, blessed are they who have not seen and yet they believe. I'm through with my sermon now, but I want to call the blessed people to step into what you believe and praise God like it's already yours. Yes, 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 yes again. When, 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 when I used to look at the text, I saw it as an opportunity to expound the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. And, and that has relevance, to be sure. But when I was studying it more recently, another dimension of the text is that it's really about integrity. It's really about holding on to your integrity. It's really about having the ability to run a scam and not running it. It's, I have always wondered in all of my life I have known so many con artists and scams and people who try to finagle their way to the top. And I've never seen them succeed. And when they do succeed, they don't last. There's some scheming in here right now for all the scheming and trickery and stuff you have done, have you noticed you're still no further than you were when you started? Ran a scam on everybody, ran a scam on your business partner, scam on your employees, scam on every business deal, scam on all kinds of women, got over on all kinds of people, and you still broke. For all of that scheming, you still got nothing Oh, I'm gonna preach right where you live. I'm coming right up your street. The devil is stealing your life away. Robbing you of your integrity is also robbing you of your opportunity. It's not can you pull it off. You can pull it off, but you'll be judged for it. You gotta stand still to see the salvation of the Lord. You got to wait on him. You got to wait on him. Sister, snatch it up some man for some money. You fool around and get something that money can't wash off. You got to stand still. It's really about integrity. You cannot be sneaky and then call yourself blessed. Here's a life changing scripture. The Bible said, woe unto him who prospers with that that is not his. You call it prosperity, but it's really just sneaky. Oh, I lost my dancers now. Lord, uh, where, where am I running? Jump, leap. Who hit the drum? Come on. <laughs> Integrity can be in a wilderness and still have ethics. Integrity can be in a wilderness and still have ethics. Integrity can be lonely and still have morality. I don't know why God had me preach this this morning. 
But this feeling that you have that somebody else has something to give you and that you may have to compromise who you are to get it is a lie from the pit. You, you cannot, hear, hear, look at me, you cannot give me what is already mine. Bow your heads, I'm gonna pray with you right where you are. All of us heard the same message, but none of us got the same word. Something in that message was for you. Don't you leave here till you find it. Underscore it and underline it. Tweet it and text it and fax it. Rehearse it in your ears and in your spirit. Because as soon as you understand what in that message was for you, that's how quick you're gonna get out of this wilderness. This wilderness will expire the moment you resist the temptation to be who the enemy is tempting you to be. It'll stop right then. The moment you quit, it will be over. The anointing of God is in this place. Your present circumstance does not predict your future. The same God that led you into this wilderness will bring you out of it. Everybody in here is in some kind of wilderness. Poor people think if they had some money, they wouldn't be in a wilderness. There are people in here right now got money, but you're in another kind of wilderness. Somebody's in a health wilderness. You're fighting for afflictions out of your body. Somebody's in a financial wilderness. Somebody's in an emotional wilderness. You're just so frustrated you don't know what in the world to do. You wish you could write a check and fix what you need. You can't get it. You can't buy it. You can't pay for it. Everybody in here is dealing with some kind of wilderness with your son, with your daughter, with your husband, with your wife, with your mother, on your job, in your church. Everybody, every son of God, Every daughter of God goes through a wilderness to get to your destiny. You're watching over the internet, you're in a wilderness right now, a dry place, financially dry, emotionally dry, sexually dry. Somewhere in your life you're dealing with dryness. God said, don't let it break you. Don't let it break you. Having done all to stand, stand there for with your loins girt about with truth. They can't give you what's already yours. The angels are coming over the hill with everything you need, with everything you long for, with everything you've been waiting on. It's coming your way. <laughs> Glory. That's the way he wants you to receive his word. To receive his word with gladness. To receive his word with gladness says that you respect God. That you know that God is not a liar. That you know if God said it, it will come to pass. To receive his word with gladness and integrity in your heart and in your spirit. Receive that word as rhema for your life, for your wilderness, for your situation, for your groaning in the middle of the night for your agonizing, for your driving around and around the block, thinking and praying and hoping God sent you a word. It's already yours. We'll be right back after this. What's pulling me down to the mountain when I have an opportunity to go to the top? If you've ever climbed a mountain, you know that reaching the summit requires perseverance, determination, and struggle. In your journey with Christ, He's often pushing you to a new and sometimes uncomfortable place. But there's always purpose in the pain. And when you reach the destination that He leads you to, the few is worth it. If you've got the key in His garment, the key to me, to who I am, to why I am, to to what I am, to where I am. And I had no chance of unlocking the door to myself without getting to the key. 
and he took the key and hid it in his garments and started up the hill and told me, you'll never know if you don't chase me. Reach the destination that was meant for you today. The view is worth it. Defeat is not an option, not on your watch. It's time to fight for the family. For every one of you who's wondering, do I have what it takes uh, for this season in my life? Uh, fight back. Let TD Jakes equip you to win the war for your house and build a legacy of faith. When you help us bless others with your gift of any size, we would like to give you I Dare You on CD. And when you complete each other, you take advantage of the differences in your position. Come on, tell me when to turn, tell me when to turn. Okay, see, I don't have to see it if she sees it. I don't have to know it if she knows it. For your gift of $70 or more, we will give you the Fight for the Family series on DVD. But when your gift is $125 or more, also receive these unique faith-inspiring bookends and prayer cards. Just call or visit tdjakes.org today. Your eye may be black and your teeth may be busted, but you look the devil in his eye and you say, baby, I'm still here. The fight is on. into the next dimension. Register today for Woman Thou Art Loose 2014 at WTAL.org or call 1-800-BISHOP2. Reach out and join hands with somebody. We're coming out of the wilderness together. We're praying. Take them by the hand. We're coming out together. I will not leave you in here. I refuse to sit right beside you and let you dry up in this wilderness with your fake smiles and your fake joy and your fake praise the Lord. And down on the inside, you're aching and hurting. The devil is a lie. I will not get this close to you and leave you going home the same way you came. Squeeze that hand. The anointing of God be upon your life. And in your heart and in your spirit, I speak to your fear and your pain and your hunger pains and your emptiness and your frustration and your need for validation and recognition. Squeeze that hand. Your blessing is coming upon you now. Alas, I am out of time, but it has been a joy over the past few weeks to share this series with you, a view from the top. Perhaps it gives you a different perspective of things. Uh, many people say they want it, but they don't know what they're asking for. I pray that God would strengthen your heart and renew your mind and adjust your goals to his divine purpose in your life. It's been a real joy to share this series with you. And I want you to know that as we pray for you, and I assume you pray for us, that no matter what we face, as long as we stay together, we will survive. Take care now. See you. This is the partner's touch. All right, here's the deal. I fully planned on uh, tackling two chapters in 1 Kings tonight, uh, chapters 7 and 8. And for those of you who read ahead to stay ahead, you know that these are very long chapters. And so I was uh, really by faith wanting to uh, complete both of them and try to have you guys out of here by about 11 p.m. Uh, <laughs> so, no, actually... Uh, very interesting chapters. At first read, it would seem that they're um, sort of, uh, you know, just mundane detail concerning the building of the temple, but there's so much just in those two chapters, and I hope that we could uh, get to that tonight. And we might still, possibly, but I'm not going to make any promises. And the reason is, is that about one o'clock this afternoon, I uh, realized that I would be somewhat remiss if I didn't take a little bit of time at least and uh, address some of the things that happened just today, but even um, some of the things that have uh, happened in the last few days, just in the last uh, week. You know, it's 
I was inquiring of the Lord about everything today and sort of wondering and, and inquiring uh, as to, is, is it just me, Lord? Is it because I'm, you know, um, always watching and I always try to keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on and maybe it's because I'm, you know, proverbially, uh, I've got my, I, I'm too close to the tree to see the the forest so maybe that that lends itself to a hypersensitivity uh, when it comes to uh, events of prophetic significance and uh, what the Lord ministered to me was is that it's not you <laughs> which that always uh, is encouraging to know that you're not alone um, it is not me uh, and I'll tell you uh, it seems like that um, things are happening now uh, by the hour uh, it's also very interesting last week uh, Ray I got a chance to uh, listen to your uh, teaching on uh, Thursday night filling in for me and uh, was really blessed and I really appreciate you addressing the elephant in the room again you know concerning September um, the reason I had Ray fill in for me last week was because um, I had been summoned for jury duty and uh, I was actually uh, uh, summoned in August, but they deferred it because I was speaking at the uh, conference, and so I could not uh, serve on jury duty. So then the, the deferment got put till this last week, and I know this was the Lord because I went in, and I don't know if you've ever, you know, went through that whole process of jury selection. What an experience. I had never experienced that uh, before. And I uh, was sort of hoping that uh, it was about a, a Muslim student who brought a clock to school, and that would, for sure, I would be excused. <laughs> well, <laughs> it wasn't that, but it, it was actually pretty close. And, I, and again, I think the Lord knew because this was going to be an unusually long uh, trial. It was, gonna, it was a civil, not a criminal uh, case. And it would last, they think, uh, and it's still going on right now, about two and a half to three weeks. And uh, that's, that's really unusual, uh, you know, for a, a, a trial, uh, especially a civic, you know, uh, case. Uh, but, um, and typically they're only a few days, maybe a week. But to have a three week, uh, even the judge stated that uh, typically the, uh, the uh, trials that, you know, as judge, she's presided over, the longest she ever had was uh, maybe three months, but all the others were just a matter of days. Well, I had really been praying about uh, this whole thing, and I, you know, I kept um, lamenting, that's a pastor's way of saying complaining uh, to the Lord about, you know, having to serve on the jury because so much is happening, and uh, I knew that Fred Hulk was uh, gonna you know go home any day and uh, so I just prayed and it was an all-day process and I didn't know if I was gonna get selected so I thought well I'll just have Ray do Thursday night anyway and then if I'm not selected then I can try to catch my breath and decompress which I did because I wasn't selected and the reason I wasn't selected was because again God knew that <laughs> I couldn't still <laughs> be serving on this jury even now but um, it happened to be a, a case against uh, a medical insurance uh, company uh, for denying uh, a, a payment on a <clears throat> procedure and so uh, when I got up I just told them that I could not be impartial because of my experience with my daughter's death and the battles that we had uh, with the insurance company so the judge uh, then turned to the attorneys, um, both the defendant and the plaintiff, and said, um, I'm inclined to defer <laughs> this uh, juror, and so who knows? I, I might get called again. Uh, I hope not. Uh, please pray that I don't. It's not that, <laughs> it's not that I don't want to serve on a jury. I think it would be a great experience, and it is my duty, and I, and I even see it as a privilege, it, it, candidly. Uh, but 
I just, I, I, I was asking the Lord about this whole process and just the amount of time it took an entire day, an entire day, and they finally called me like about 4 p.m. I'm like, Lord, why couldn't they have just called me at 9 a.m.? You know, anyway, so uh, am I complaining? Yes, I am. <laughs> well, anyway, um, but I, get, I, th I think that, you know, the enemy has really been trying to um, derail me and um, j trying to take me out of uh, commission. You have no idea. Uh, I'm not going to even get into that. It's been really, really intense. Um, today was one of those days that, um, as a teacher of Bible prophecy, you just kind of scratch your head and um, uh, cry out, Lord, come quickly. <laughs> Uh, I know that you have heard about this breaking news today. Um, there was this mass shooting. Uh, a man killed what some are reporting to be as many as 10 people. Uh, there's conflicting reports. Uh, one report was that there were as many as 13 people that were killed. These were students at a uh, Oregon community college. Uh, they are uh, they're, uh, reporting that 20 people were injured. Uh, this is a very different uh, shooting, school shooting, in the sense that uh, I cannot remember uh, any shooting where virtually no information was being provided. And it was, uh, it, even the uh, news uh, anchors were commenting on how unusual it was that uh, no information was being given. Even the press conferences, they would not take any questions. They were very almost cryptic with their, uh, their answers. And um, nobody was telling anybody anything as of early this afternoon. Then finally about 3 p.m. Hawaii time, I went on Twitter and learned that CBS News had reported that the name of the perpetrator was 27-year-old Chris Harper Mercer. I want to show you a, a photo that I got off of Twitter. Uh, this is uh, him, and you can see that he is holding a gun. Uh, now, uh, about 4 p.m. Hawaii time, I found this New York Post report with the headline, Oregon gunmen singled out Christians during rampage. I'm going to quote the article, and then I want to comment on this uh, just a little bit here. The shooter was lining people up and asking if they were Christians. And apparently this was um, a text message that was sent from one student there on the campus to the other. And uh, they were uh, trying to, you know, apprise everybody of what was uh, going on with this active shooter. So apparently the shooter, and this is confirmed by multiple uh, uh, news agencies. Uh, here, here's what this, um, uh, I'm going to again just quote the article. Uh, the shooter was lining people up and asking if they were Christians, she wrote. If they said yes, then they were shot in the head. If they said no, or didn't answer, they were shot in the legs. My grandma just got to my house and she was in the room. She wasn't shot, but she is very upset. Um, a lot of information is uh, being posted on social media. Um, I found this tweet on Twitter. Not surprised, uh, but you have to understand that um, I just put this together just this afternoon prior to uh, coming tonight and usually I like to spend a, a considerable amount of time vetting everything that I'm reading uh, so that I'm not, you know, putting out false information. But uh, the only reason I, I mention this is that uh, I believe the reason why information was sparse at best and intentionally and deliberately withheld at worst is because this is a Muslim who has gone into a school 
a community college in Oregon, of all places, and by the way, by design, because of Oregon's gun laws. I'll talk about that in a moment. And he has singled out the Christians according to the Quran. Because the Muslim in the Quran is commanded to strike terror in the hearts of the infidel, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, and to kill them wherever you find them, and to smite ye them above their necks, to behead them, basically. And so um, it may turn out that this is not the case, but um, I got to tell you, I would be absolutely shocked if it isn't. I mean, this is, has all of the markings of yet another uh, Islamic terrorist attack in the state of Oregon, of all states. Now, I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that within just a matter of hours after the shooting, Obama would angrily scold Americans concerning gun control and in so doing all but threaten to change the Second Amendment. I learned a little bit uh, today as I started uh, researching this and reading about this and um, one uh, uh, newscast pointed out uh, because in, in this stunning speech and it was just stunning and disconcerting it was as disconcerting as it was stunning because he said this before any information had been released the name of the shooter had not been released and here's what's really interesting and this has led some to speculate that there is in play a conspiracy and I'm not as quick as I used to be uh, to be dismissive of the conspiratory uh, you know suggestions but um, what we did find out almost immediately was what kind of weapons he had the number of guns the type of I don't know anything about guns I mean that's a good thing that as an Arab I don't know anything about weapons but anyway um, the type of guns, the number of guns, and it was, uh, the comment was made that this is uh, unprecedented that you would have that information released and have that be the only information that's released that close in proximity to the crime. It makes no sense. They, they should not be, quote, transparent end quote, as one said it, when it comes to that forensic evidence. So again, you, you kind of wonder, and the only reason I would even mention that there may be, that I think we would be remiss to dismiss that kind of a conspiracy is because it eclipsed almost at the same exact time the most powerful and profound speech that was ever delivered to the United Nations General Assembly in the history of the UN. Uh, how many of you watched this one? Keep your hands up, one, two, three, four five, six, boy, you guys, I can't even begin to tell you how important it is that you go online and just search Netanyahu UN General Assembly speech. You need to watch this. In fact, I was, if I had more time today, I would have tried to get uh, the video to at least show you uh, this speech in part. Um, right after Netanyahu's speech, this news broke about what happened in Oregon. And it was almost like, in fact, I read one uh, tweet on Twitter, said, uh, how do we get 
everybody's attention away from what Netanyahu said at the UN and how do we get everybody's attention away from what Russia and Iran are doing in Syria oh I know let's have a false flag mass shooting in Oregon now I'm not in any way suggesting that that's what it is but when when the timing of it is such as it was today you, you almost you kinda gotta wonder and that's why I think that we would be remiss to be dismissive of it. Let me quote, uh, there's just, there's, there's two things I want to uh, quote uh, from his speech. They're just so, it is so powerful, so powerful. Quoting the Prime Minister, As for the Supreme Leader himself, speaking of the Ayatollah Khamenei, a few days after the nuclear deal was announced, he released his latest book. Here it is. You see it pictured here. He's holding up the Supreme Leader's book. Did you hear about this? It's a 400-page creed detailing his plan to destroy the state of Israel. Last month, Khamenei once again made his genocidal intentions clear before Iran's top clerical body, the assembly of experts. He spoke about Israel, home to over six million Jews. He pledged, quoting the Supreme Leader, there will be no Israel in 25 years. Seventy years after the murder of six million Jews, Iran's rulers promise to destroy my country, murder my people. And the response from this body, the response from nearly everyone of the governments represented here has been, and he pauses, absolutely nothing. Utter Silence, deafening silence. I'm going to put a picture of the prime minister of what he looked like after he said this. For the next 45 seconds, Netanyahu stared down the assembly with a silence that doubtless was heard around the world. <laughs> this was early this morning. Um, I was sitting there in my office. I've got, you know, the TV's going. I got all my, you know, screens with my internet, you know, going and, and things are lighting up and, I'm, and I watched it live as he's delivering. Of course, this is in New York, so it's early in the morning for us. And when he got to this point, I just, he stopped and he just look at that look <laughs> stink eye is an understatement if you ask me he did this for 45 seconds you could have heard a pin drop through the TV and it was the most uncomfortable thing and they were panning I couldn't believe they did this they were actually panning around the assembly and people were just visibly uncomfortable. It was, as one said, awkward. You know, 45 seconds of a speech. I mean, if I stopped talking for 45 seconds, I know that would be a miracle if I could actually do that. I don't know that I could. <laughs> but if I could, it would seem like an eternity. And as he's doing it, he's not looking down. Well, he might glance at his notes, but he's looking at everybody in the assembly. You know, because I have, uh, you know, different news stations going on at the same time, it's, it's always kind of humorous to see the comparison of the news tickers uh, on the different, you know, channels, particularly CNN as opposed to, say, somebody like Fox. And, you know, CNN is just blasting Netanyahu and you can always, you know, the, the captions underneath. And I just, I thought to myself, you know, 
They don't get it. They don't get it. I, I, I truly can only reconcile it in my own mind and heart as being that people are deceived and people are blind to the truth. Here's another quote from Benjamin Netanyahu. This one, I just, I think it says it all. Now another regime has arisen, speaking of Iran, swearing to destroy Israel. That regime would be wise to consider this. I stand here today representing Israel, a country 67 years young, but the nation state of people nearly 4,000 years old. Yet the empires of Babylon and Rome are not represented in this hall of nations. Neither is the thousand year Reich. Those seemingly invincible empires are long gone, but Israel lives. The people of Israel live, and they will. I was aghast with an unspeakable disgust. And I find it utterly shameful that the U.S. delegates pictured here refused to applaud Netanyahu's speech. And if this weren't bad enough, notice that conspicuously absent. You see those two chairs in the back? Well, the ones in the front would normally be occupied by the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Samantha Power, absent. How about the Secretary of State, John Kerry, absent? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You know, I take a lot of heat and I get excoriated on social media every time I talk about judgment coming to the United States of America. I get called the most vile of names whenever I say that the United States of America has sealed her fate and it's too late, which would certainly explain the absence of the United States of America from Bible prophecy, wouldn't it? But when I see something like this today, maybe that explains this. You hear about this? This has got a lot of experts freaked out. Um, this just today too. Boy, today was, I wish that they wouldn't pick Thursday. I'm trying to study for, <laughs> you know, the, the Bible study on Thursday nights, but uh, made for a busy day. I had to skip dinner. Don't feel too sorry for me. I need to skip a few dinners. Um, just today, uh, several states on the East Coast uh, are declaring a state of emergency in anticipation of this hurricane Joaquin, not Wahid, Joaquin. <laughs> as God is my witness, if they ever name a hurricane <laughs> Wahid, uh, Jesus is coming for sure, I'm telling you. <laughs> so it's strengthened to a category four storm, and the problem is, is that <laughs> it's kind of humorous. You look at these, uh, you know, uh, weather uh, patterns where they're trying to predict what course it's going to take, and it's like this. They don't know, and, and there's a reason for that. Nobody knows what this thing's going to do, and they don't know how hard it's going to hit. The concern, according to one source, is, quote, Hurricane Joaquin is locked in a dance with an extraordinarily heavy rainstorm that is already drenching the Carolinas. I read uh, just one headline before I left to come tonight, and already there's one death 
from the uh, floods, and this storm hasn't even hit yet. And what's really unique about this particular storm is that there's this merging with an already heavy rainstorm uh, there as well. Uh, and this uh, source goes on to say, as the two draw closer together over the next few days, the effects could be disastrous for the East Coast. Um, all of the uh, governors have uh, gone on uh, TV and announced that they have declared their states a state of emergency, and now everybody is watching to see what's going to happen with this storm. I guess we'll, we'll find out. Um, I did read a few uh, articles, and I knew I would. I've actually talked about this before, but there are those who suggest that there's a connection between this storm and what's going on at the United Nations this last week. Uh, chiefly, the raising of the Palestinian flag at the United Nations for the first time this was yesterday, and it was just moments after Mahmoud Abbas delivered a controversial speech at the UN General Assembly in which he declared basically that the Palestinian Authority was no longer bound by the Oslo Peace Accords with Israel. I can't even begin to tell you how huge this is, by the way. But you know about the Oslo Peace Accords. September of 1993, a peace agreement was made with then President Clinton on the White House lawn and the Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat. And that peace agreement was known as the Oslo Peace Accords was to actually arrive at an agreement between the Jews and the Palestinians. Now, for Abbas to say what he said after having the Palestinian flag raised brings to mind a very significant prophecy and one that we've talked about uh, over the years, and it's Daniel 9.27. And I'll explain why. I'm going to just read it real quick. He will confirm a covenant. Hang on to that for a second. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, a period of seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, stay with me on this. This is very, very important and germane to our understanding of prophetic events and how everything will go down during the seven-year tribulation. This covenant that the Antichrist will confirm carries with it in the original language of the Hebrew Old Testament the idea of enforcing it, it, by force. He will force the confirming of a covenant which implies that there was already a covenant in place. He doesn't make the covenant, he confirms it. He enforces it. In other words, he enforces something that has already been agreed to, but something that has been tossed to the side, which is why he has to confirm it and enforce it. And it will be a seven-year agreement and it will be the seven year tribulation and in the middle of the seven years at the three and a half year mark the antichrist is going to commit the abomination that causes desolation and some believe and by the way this will be in the temple that the antichrist i believe as part of this covenant that he enforces and confirms that he will let the Jews build their temple. Now there's a 
A lot of debate about where the temple will be built. Some believe that it will not be where the Dome of the Rock is, that you will not have to disturb the Dome of the Rock. And certainly they make a compelling argument. And that would surely make sense because of the outer courts which are belong, to the, belong to the Gentiles, which is another prophecy in the book of Revelation. So for those of you who went to Israel with us and were able to go up on the Temple Mount in 2008, you remember that huge area with nothing on it? Some believe that's where the temple will be. And by the way, it lines up with the Eastern Gate, which was sealed shut, because that's the gate when Jesus returns that he will enter through when he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives where we stood and it's gonna split and oh my goodness and by the way we're gonna be there we're gonna have front row seats because <laughs> at the rapture Jesus comes for us at the second coming Jesus comes with us ten thousands by his side but they will have rebuilt their temple and then he will demand to be worshipped and he will commit this abomination probably the sacrificing of an unclean animal and it will cause desolation and by the way it's believed that at this point the Jews will realize this is not their Messiah this is a false Messiah this is the anti-Messiah and they will flee Jerusalem and for the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation, God will protect them in, of all places, Petra, which is in modern-day Jordan. That's a whole other teaching for another time, maybe, but it is very, very fascinating. Uh, in fact, one um, historian and uh, prophecy expert many, many years ago was so convinced that Petra was going to be the place that the Jews fled to during the second half of the seven year tribulation he actually put the scriptures that prophesied that in earthen vessels and hid them in Petra so when the Jews get there they're gonna have those scriptures that foretell that this will happen I want to uh, time is going by too fast but I want to take a little bit of time and talk about the Pope um, you know, I, I mentioned the Pope last week, and uh, I knew I was gonna, I knew I was gonna get it, and I did. Uh, we had a, a YouTube subscriber that uh, really uh, blasted me uh, concerning the statement, the quote from the Pope that uh, the cross was a failure. Uh, I, I don't have the quote tonight. I, I mentioned this on Sunday. And I went back and tried to sort of uh, connect the dots as to why it is that uh, he would say that. I had another uh, comment on YouTube about, uh, well, he was just referring to how, you know, like what Paul talks about to the Corinthians, that uh, the, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And so I, you know, hey, be a Berean. I like that. So good. Let's, let's, uh, let's search the scriptures on that. That's not what he said. He did not say the cross was foolishness. And this was not a, a homily to those who are perishing for whom the cross would be foolishness too. No, he was very clear that the cross was a failure. And so I just said, Lord, I need some help on this. Um, I want to know why. Why? And then the Lord just ministered to me that Catholicism does not see the cross as a success, as the greatest victory of all humankind. And by the way, think about this now. Is this not why every time you see a Catholic crucifix, He's still on the cross. Why is my Jesus still on your cross? Because the cross was a failure. Why do you think it is that Catholics believe in what is known as transubstantiation? What's transubstantiation? Every time 
they partake of the cup and the bread, they believe that it literally, miraculously, mystically turns into the literal blood and body of Christ. Why? Because they have to continually sacrifice Christ. Every time they partake of communion, they sacrifice Jesus Christ anew. In that same homily, I read the uh, text of the homily. He made a comment in there and it, and it hit me. He said that God has called us to conversion daily. What? What? No, no, no. The sacrifice the writer of Hebrews tells us, makes it very clear in chapter 10, is once and for all. Once and for all. It is finished. Period. Not comma. Not semicolon. Not dash. Not dot, dot, dot. It is finished. So get him off the cross because it's finished. When you get into Revelation and you read about the church of Thyatira, very interesting. Um, <laughs> they had good works. This was a church, you want to talk about works, man. This church was a church that was a church of good works. Some have suggested that the name Thyatira means continual sacrifice. And as such, they have ascribed this letter prophetically to the Catholic Church in the present day. Um... He also said in there that, in his homily, and there was no gospel. There was no salvation by grace through faith, not of works. It's the gift of God, not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, none of that. The message was about works. We need to sacrifice and do good works. So just to refresh my ever-failing memory, I decided to go online and just try to uh, revisit some of the Catholic, Catholicism doctrines. And sure enough, right there in plain sight, and they don't try to hide it either, uh, salvation is by grace and works. And works. By the way, <clears throat> um, Catholics believe in theistic evolution. You know what theistic evolution is? That God used evolution to create the earth. He, he, God created earth through the evolutionary process. <laughs> um, I could go on and on and on. And I, I am keenly aware that whenever I talk about the Pope, I'm going to get it. And you know what? I have to say it, because it's the truth. Now, that leads me to this. The Pope also addressed the United Nations General Assembly, and I went online and I found the, um, I didn't have time over the weekend, but I wanted to read the text uh, from what he said. And I read it through, and it was basically what I had, you know, expected. Um, but let me read you a quote, and then I want to draw your attention to something that he said that is not easily seen at first read. Quoting the Pope. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind words. Once again, following a tradition by which I feel honored, the Secretary General of the United Nations has invited the Pope to address this distinguished assembly of nations. I'm quoting, in my own name, hang on to that, and that of the entire Catholic community, I wish to express to you 
Mr. Ban Ki-moon, my heartfelt gratitude. Okay. In my own name. Now consider the words of the Savior recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. You'll forgive me, but I think anybody would be hard-pressed to look you in the eye with a straight face and not say to you that if Jesus Christ was here, he would stir up that much attention. Did you see how people worshipped him who comes in his own name? Uh, I didn't get a chance to read the text on this, but apparently there was a, um, some sort of a 9-11 thing that the Pope attended. And there was a, a Sikh, a Muslim a cleric. There was representation from all faiths present at this 9-11 memorial. Uh, by the way, <laughs> when it comes to Catholicism and Islam, I don't know if you remember a while back, I showed you a picture of then Pope John Paul II kissing the Quran. And it was interesting because it happened to be from Iraq, Babylon, a Quran, and he's kissing it. Uh, this last, I want to say it was last year now, I don't know how long it's been, I think it was last year, uh, the first time in the history of the Catholic Church they had uh, uh, Islamic prayers at the uh, Vatican. Um, I'm, again, I, I usually like to take time to vet these things before I, you know, address them, but um, well, let me just show you this next slide and we'll try to move on here. Um, this is a, a photo from Huffington Post. <laughs> you know, that bastion of conservative news reporting. Um, the article title, you see it on the screen, Pope Francis wants to be president of the world. Oh, and, and here's the subtitle. Okay, that's not a real job, but he is seeking to lead the global conversation. This last week I also didn't have time to uh, read the uh, full text that Vladimir Putin uh, in his speech to the UN, I also didn't read in its entirety the uh, president's, uh, U.S. president's speech to the UN, but what I'm hearing from those who did is that there was a consensus at this UN General Assembly that basically gives birth to a new world order a new world order. Now, I don't know if it's possible to write the script any more accurately, even verbatim, when it comes to what we're told it will be during the last seven years of human history. And one of the reasons I don't think you could write the script more perfectly is because of what Russia and Iran are now doing, joining hands together in Syria. This was just yesterday, too. I don't know if you heard about this. This is huge. <laughs> this is huge. Um, breaking news. In fact, I, I was, you know, studying and working, and all of a sudden I see on the, on the screen... Russia launches airstrikes in Syria. And it's one of those things where you, you know how you, you do a double take? It's kind of like, <laughs> I'm just, turn the mute off, turn it up. What? Are you, wait, what? What? Well, yeah, they, 
And if that's not bad enough, check this out. They told the United States to get out of the way. Today, the Telegraph published an article with the headline, Russian general tells U.S. diplomats, we launched Syria airstrikes in one hour. Stay out of the way. <laughs> okay. Um, Isaiah 17. Ezekiel 38. Do you remember that prophecy puzzle? I haven't, might need to revisit that again. I haven't shared that in quite a while, but I basically had several puzzle pieces of in terms of the order chronologically, a plausible scenario in which they would happen, and right at the very beginning was Isaiah 17 and with it Psalm 83. And this because Syria is the catalyst. Um, there were some conflicting reports out today, and I was waiting all day for this uh, press conference between uh, John Kerry and his Russian counterpart who's here for the UN General Assembly. And it was the most laughable uh, four-minute, whatever it was, uh, joke that you could ever levy on smart uh, American people. And I'll, I'll add Russian people as well. Uh, Joel Rosenberg, I want to just share with you real quickly. He just uh, posted this on his blog today. It's titled, Putin orders Russian military forces into combat in Syria just miles from northern border of Israel. Russian forces working closely with Iran. Here's the latest. Let me just quote a little bit. And by the way, just this is a good read. Um, in the Kremlin's biggest military operation in the Middle East since, get this, 1941... Russian air and ground forces are now engaged in combat in Syria, and they are now operating just miles from the northern mountains of Israel. <laughs> the Kremlin's stated objective is to defeat ISIS. The conflicting reports today were they're not hitting ISIS. You know where they're bombing? Where we are. The Kremlin's stated objective is to defeat ISIS and protect the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, a longtime Russian ally in the Middle East. But Vladimir Putin's aggressive moves have broader, more ominous implications. Number one, Putin is a czar, an imperialist, consumed with Mother Russia. Mother Russia's need to expand its borders and influence and he is now on the move to seize control of the dynamic in the epicenter. Number two, Putin specifically wants to replace the United States as the dominant military and political force in the Near East. Uh, I think he's done a pretty good job of that. It's been firm bipartisan U.S. foreign policy since World War II to keep the Russian military out of the Middle East, yet President Obama is surrendering the region to the Kremlin with breathtaking speed and foolish recklessness. I don't quite see it that way. I believe it is breakneck speed, but I don't know about foolish recklessness. That implies that this is just ignorance, and I don't see Obama as ignorant. I see him as extremely intelligent, and not in the ways that you might think. And I would suggest to you that this is deliberate. If the President of the United States' sole objective is to dismantle the once most powerful and blessed nation on earth, then that would make sense. Foolish recklessness does not. I will just respectfully disagree with Rosenberg whom I'm a big fan of. Number three, Putin is not alone in making these moves. He is working hand in glove with Iran's government, 
which is also sending military forces into Syria. Before my dad died, he told me, in fact, it was after the Oslo Peace Accords were signed, just keep your eye on Syria. Just keep your eye on Syria. Syria is the linchpin, it's the nexus. The Hebrew prophet, lastly, Ezekiel, wrote 2,500 years ago that in the last days of history, Russia and Iran will from, form a military alliance to attack Israel from the north. Bible scholars refer to this eschatological conflict described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 as the war of Gog and Magog. Are these sudden and dramatic moves by Moscow and Tehran simply coincidental or do they have prophetic implications? I would suggest it's the latter. Uh, one prophecy expert uh, said, he put out a YouTube video and said, I'm not quite ready to say that this is the beginning fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39, and I can appreciate wanting to be an heir on the side of an abundance of caution, especially in this time that we're in, where there's so much false information out there. I mean, you got to be really discerning, you know, when you go online. You really got to know the Word of God. This is what we were talking about on Sunday. It's only those who really know the Word of God that stand any chance of not being deceived in these last days with this strong delusion. I'm just going to say it. I don't care anymore. <laughs> I got nothing to lose at this point. Um, I believe it is. I believe it is. And again, I, I know I could be accused of being too close to the tree to see the forest. But I, I got to tell you, in 2006, nine years ago now, I sensed that the Lord would have me to start doing these weekly prophecy updates. We've been doing them ever since. And the reason I sensed that was because we were entering into a period of human history that was the likes of which mankind had never seen before, that we were entering into the last moments of world history. Not the last days, the last hours. And so when I see what is happening now with Russia and Iran in Syria, it's just a catalyst. It's just the avenue. It's the route that they're going to take in order to attack Israel. And by the way, doesn't a, a oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Doesn't a powerless, feckless, nebulous United States of America fit? Where, where's the United States when they attack Israel? At best, verse 13, Ezekiel 38, America has been completely defanged, if I can say it that way, and all we do is protest with the likes of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Saudi Arabia. Well, we've talked about that. Let me just uh, try to... You want to do First Kings 7 and 8? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's the last one. And... Nobody's talking about this. I mean, it's almost like, who cares, right? But Gaza rocket fire has started raining down on Israel yet again, again. Pictured here is the Iron Dome interceptor. And were it not for, I believe, by the grace of God and the hand of God, this Iron Dome protector. Um, Israel may not exist. Now, I know that that's impossible. Uh, tonight, during the worship, the Lord just uh, reminded me of Psalm uh, 73. It's a Psalm of Asaph. It's the, uh, the same uh, author that wrote Psalm 83. 
uh, the, uh, uh, the prophecy uh, in Psalm 83 about wiping Israel off the map. But Psalm 73 is interesting because it starts off with this, you know, bleak, sort of morose, you know, description of how evil just seems to prosper. Unchecked. Evil just continues to move forward and I just want to we'll close with this psalm if you wouldn't mind I want to read Psalm 73 in its entirety surely God is good to Israel to those who are pure in heart but as for me my feet had almost slipped I had nearly lost my foothold for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burden common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. That's quite a description. They clothe themselves, listen to this, with violence, violence from their callous hearts comes iniquity the evil conceits of their minds know no limits they scoff verse 8 and speak with malice in their arrogance they threaten oppression <laughs> so you're reading the, the, the headlines their mouths lay claim to heaven wow and their tongues take possession of the earth. They can have it after we're gone. They're only going to get it for seven years. Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure? In vain have I washed my hands in innocence? All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. That, that's what happens every morning for me. I get punished when I turn on the news and see what's happened next. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all of this, it was oppressive to me, weighty. Till, verse 17, listen, I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Stop right there. <laughs> That's how it's going to end for them. And, and, when I see that God in the end will mete out just justice and that is their final destiny, it calms me. It settles me. Surely, verse 18, you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed? Can you say sudden destruction? completely swept away by terrors as a dream when one awakens so when you will rise O Lord you will despise them as fantasies when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered boy that is a is not what we awake to every day in the world seemingly day by day? Is it not grievous? Verse 22, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yes, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. I can't wait. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth 
has nothing I desire besides you. Boy, is that not the truth. If anything, as we see evil prosper, unchecked, if it does anything, it loosens our grip on this world and the things of this world that are passing away. There's nothing here anymore. There's nothing here. This is not my home. This is not my final destination. I don't belong here. <laughs> Christians have overstayed their welcome here. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I think of what Oswald Chambers said once, God will never fault a man for despair. When you're down and discouraged and in despair, your flesh and your heart fail, God never holds that against you. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those, verse 27, who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good, and I like this, to be near to God. Can I say it this way? If there was ever a time to be near to God, it is now. I have made the Sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. He is our refuge, our ever-present help in times of trouble. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. Lord, thank you once again for settling us and refocusing us on the truth in the midst of all of the lies from all over the place. There are so many voices clamoring for our attention in these last days, but the only voice we want to hear and heed is the still small voice of the Holy Spirit as you speak and minister to us. Lord, thank you that we can draw near to you and that when we draw near to you, you in turn, James says, draw near to us. Lord, we readily confess that if there was ever a time that we need to walk close with you, be right with you, return to you if need be, that that time is now. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.